On behalf of the National Eczema Association, I would like to welcome you all to our webinar Wednesday presentation, The Skinny on TSW and Steroids. I'm your host, Lauren Hewitt, Marketing Director at the National Eczema Association. Today's webinar is made possible in part by an educational grant from Santa Fe Regeneron. Our presenters today are Kelly Barda and Dr. Peter Leo. Kelly Barda serves as president of the Coalition of Skin Diseases. She served as past president of Inter International Topical Steroid Awareness Network, ITSAN, and continues su to support their mission as a member of their board of directors. Dr. Peter Leo is assistant professor of clinical dermatology and pediatric dermatology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, and he's founding director of the Chicago Integrative Ex Eczema Center. And with that, I am pleased to introduce our presenters. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for taking time to be here tonight. Um, I'm Kelly Barta, as Lauren mentioned. And first of all, just want to say thank you to Nia for highlighting such an important issue. Um, this is a really big deal in the exa commun eczema community. If you've been on uh, social media, there's quite a buzz there about this topic. So we're really grateful that Nia is highlighting this. I also want to recognize Dr. Leo, who's presenting with me today, who has been such an amazing ally to the TSW community and a real hero of a doctor. We are super lucky to have him in our corner. So without further ado, let's get started. So more than likely, we have a variety of people on this call. Um, maybe you're here because you've heard about TSW and you want to learn more. Maybe you think you might be at risk if you're in the eczema community and you've used topical steroids for a long time, or maybe you're going through or know someone who is experiencing TSW. And before we begin, um, I just want to say, if this is you, especially those who are going through TSW, know there is hope. Um, even though we don't know a ton, we know some and the answers are coming and you are not alone. So just to begin, I want to give you a little tiny bit of my eczema TSW history so you know who I am. Um, I was diagnosed with eczema as a little girl, four or five years old, with a typical behind the knees and the crooks of the arm eczema. And I really managed my condition throughout my um, years up until around I was in my mid-30s um, with topical steroids and I used Protopic on my face. Um, and I wasn't as concerned about my skin as I was to my um, growing allergies and food sensitivities. It was really disturbing me. And I wasn't getting good answers from my doctors at the time. And so I started to do research on my own and found, yes, there was a correlation between heightened immune response and steroid use because they upregulate IgE levels in the body. So I thought, well, I'll just, you know, use better barrier creams and I won't use as many steroids and hopefully my body will level out. Well, little did I know that I was weaning myself off steroids. And when I stopped them completely, I went, I was in for the shock of my life. I had no idea um, about TSW, had never heard of it. This was 2012 when there wasn't a lot of talk about it yet. Um, but I was up after stopping steroids for a couple of days and my skin started burning and each itching bone deep. I was up through the night and I came across ITSAN, the International Topical Steroid Awareness Network. And even though on one hand, I felt this great sense of relief, like, oh my gosh, this makes sense. Now I get it, what's happening with my health. At the same time, I was kind of horrified with seeing that these people were going through, having to go through hell and back to reclaim um, their health. So I made the decision, I'm going to do this. Um, and, and it was a pretty severe protracted condition. I think I experienced just about every TSW symptom there was. I lived between my bed and the bathtub for a long time. And because of um, how it impacted my life and my family, I knew I had to get involved in advocacy to raise awareness and really change the tide around this condition, supporting people and also making the changes necessary to prevent it from happening in the first place. So nowadays, this is me, you can see on the left, I'm here with my two amazing sons. And then uh, last year, I published a book to eczema with love, and I'm there with my sister, Jody. We had gotten our first copy in the mail. And then in the middle, here are the uh, just absolutely dedicated, uh, wonderful ITSAN crew. Um, I think most of them are here on the line tonight. So big shout out to Kathy, our president, and all of our board members who put in so much time um, 
on top of their day-to-day -day jobs and their families. And we're just really grateful for them. And then here on the bottom is my, my day job where I run the Coalition of Skin Diseases. And we advocate for the 84 million Americans living with a skin disease, if you can believe that. We're 20 different national or 28 different national nonprofits and Nia and Itzan are part of this group. Um, and we advocate together for skin patients. So let's get started, TSW basics. Um, and all, although I said, as like before, um, we don't have a ton of information on TSW, it's still considered an emerging condition um, because of the scientific literature we have in the over decade that we have worked with the ITSAN community. This is what we're seeing as far as when you have eczema, um, signs of dependence on the drug, and then what happens after discontinuing. These are the symptoms for TSW. So we'll just read through these. Um, the symptoms of dependence are rebound redness between applications, rashes spreading and developing to new areas of the body. What So what started for me and the crooks of my arms and behind my knees started to spread to my neck, to my hands, to my torso, and they, it's like you're chasing the rash around. Intense itching, burning, and stinging that's different from the original baseline eczema. Failure to clear with usual course of treatment, requiring a higher potency topical steroid to achieve progressively less clearing, which was me. I started out um, with a typical hydrocortisone, which went to triamcinolone, to elecon, and then I ended up in a high potency beta-methasone dipropionate. And then increased allergic response, I had that as well. So while protracted and severe TSW symptoms do resolve over time with cessation of topical steroids. So now looking at the symptoms after discontinuation, we have skin flushing bright red, or in some cases, brown or black, depending on the um, pigmentation in your skin. So again, red, black, brown, black sleeves, depending on your skin tone, your arms and legs between become red and darkened and inflamed, sparing the palms and soles. So this is, um, like it says here, considered red sleeves, it, like the, the, the color goes right up to the palms and to the soles of the feet. Intense itching and burning, much greater than original eczema. Profuse shedding of the skin appears to be snowing. Oozing of the skin, cycling between this oozing, swelling, burning, and flaking. Um, thermal dysregulation, so you're super hot and you're super cold. I remember being under a duvet comforter in the middle of a Georgia hot summer, but I just could not get warm. Hypersensitivity to skin, to water, movement. Um, clothes, temperature, lots of products that you were able to use before, all of a sudden you're extremely allergic. Nerve pain, sometimes considered as sparklers or zingers, and sometimes it can just be a pang, um, but that's definitely not an eczema system or um, symptom. Enlarged lymph nodes, edema or swelling, like you saw in my pictures, um, they're considered elephant wrinkles many times. Um, eye dryness and irritation, hair loss, insomnia, altered body clock, Appetite changes, fatigue, and emotional fluctuations, depression, and anxiety. So what does the literature say about the time frame? Because it's all over the place. And to be honest, we don't have a definite time frame where it seems like it's it's different for different people. Sometimes it can take several months up to several years, as you see in the 2012 paper. Um, the 2016 paper says the prolonged withdrawal period, months to years, can take a significant toll on patients' mental health. Um, and then the last one, this pattern of flare and quiescence repeats itself. But over time, the flares are... Um, shorter in duration, and they're usually not as severe, and then they finally do burn out. So what does the TSW community say about prevention? Many feel that their TSW syndrome could have been prevented if they had been educated about the predisposing factors and risks of TSW, if their topical steroid use had been closely monitored by their doctor, or if steroids had not been prescribed as a first step in addressing their eczema, but um, other courses were um, pursued instead, such as allergy testing and things of that nature. So as I was preparing for this talk, I, I stopped to think about, you know, what were the things that I wish I would have known 10, 20 years ago that I learned through this whole process of TSW? And I was bedridden for a while. And so it gave me a lot of time to do a ton of research. And um, I was just shocked at some of the things that I had no idea about. So just kind of going down this list here, if I knew I had the potential, first of all, that TSW existed, but if I had the potential to develop it and what that was going to be like, how it, up, it just turned my life upside down, I would have taken better care of my body to manage my skin instead of turning to a quick fix. I would have looked at things like my diet and my environment and things like that.
Um, I learned that 60 to 100% of what we put on our skin actually absorbs into our body. I never, ever thought about that. I always thought my skin was my enemy. You know, it was just so reactive. I never thought about all the products that I was using, just hundreds of products. Really, I, all I cared about, it doesn't make my hair shiny or does it smell good? But I wasn't thinking that, you know, some of these fragrances and chemicals can actually um, harm my skin and make my eczema worse. So topical steroid potency, where you use, how long you use, all of those things matter. I did not know that steroid side effects are cumulative, which means they build up over time. The longer you use them, the more risk there is. Um, I did not know that steroids, topical steroids were approved by the FDA for short-term non-continuous use because these are being prescribed for years to decades. I had no idea about that. The mechanism of action of the steroids themselves is not well understood, and they do affect hundreds of cells in the body that um, science is still working on this and trying to figure out all the different ways that they affect the body. And then lastly, all drugs have side effects, and we need to be mindful of the use. I think sometimes we forget about that. Oh, you know, it's just a cream, no big deal, um, but they are a drug. So monitoring and open communication around steroid use is so important. Um, we need to be thinking about what topical steroids are we using? What's the potency? A lot of times you can see just the molecule name, um, but many times I have people come to me and say, is this a steroid? I don't even know if it's a steroid. It's really important to know what it is and what the potency is because that matters where you put that um, cream on, then on your body. Um, how much of your body are you treating? Um, there are certain rules around that. You shouldn't be using over 20% of your body. Well, how do we figure that out? Um, these are things to think about. How often are we using topical steroids per day, per week? How many fingertip units per day and on what areas? Um, like I mentioned, absorption differs by body parts. So on your face, under your arms and genital areas, these this is where your skin is a lot more um, permeable. So you can absorb more in those areas. Do you have other prescriptions from doctors um, with steroids that you might not be considering um, in, a, in, in the accumulative load that you're um, absorbing? And are you having any new symptoms? So I, I really like this quote here from this paper that says close communication with other health professionals is necessary to ensure that the patient is not left unmonitored. This kind of interprofessional interprofessional team methodology to corticosteroid therapy will yield improved patient results while mitigating or lessening the numerous and potentially serious adverse effects of such therapy, especially when these agents are used long-term. So it's really important that your doctors are talking um, amongst themselves and everyone's aware of all the different steroids you might be using. We know that a lot of eczema patients are also asthma patients or, or have other seasonal allergies. So you could be using nasal sprays, ear eye drops, inhaled um, orals. So I just wanted to highlight some of the current challenges around TSW that we're seeing, um, especially in our work with ITSAN. We work with many different stakeholders to try to solve this overall problem. Um, but in the patient community, there's no warning of the potential risk of topical steroid dependence or TSW. There's lack of support in targeted treatments. There's unclear um, steroid usage guidelines. Um, on most creams, it will say use on affected areas as directed, that's not a dose. And there's no max dose or time frame for these drugs currently. So with healthcare providers, there's a lack of awareness. Um, many doctors have never heard of TSW and there's a lack of awareness and acknowledgement of TSW to prevent, recognize, diagnose, and treat. There's currently no diagnostic criteria or clear TSW treatment guidelines. So that makes it pretty tough for doctors. In the science arena, there's a lack of research to understand the predisposing risk factors, the mechanisms of what's actually happening in TSW and what treatments are available. And then in regulator, regula, regulatory bodies such as the FDA, there's an adequate usage and prescribing guidelines of TS. There's no warning of the risk of TSW on product labels. This is something that we've been advocating for um, because patients should be aware that there is a risk when they're reading those labels. There's inadequate monitoring of steroid exposure and negative effects. So these are a lot of challenges um, that need to be overcome. And then for those who are in TSW, it's a super tough spot to be when you're the person who's actually going through this because it's still poorly understood um, we don't know why some experience tsws and not others it isn't everybody some people can use steroids till the day they die and they don't have this outcome how do i how do patients know if they're at risk um what do we do to treat how can we fix this how long will it take to recover we don't know clear answers to these questions um and and with that uncertainty 
comes a lot of um, just mental weight around that because you just don't know how long you can continue on. Um, a lack of awareness often means that lack of medical support um, leads to lack of family and community support. So if your doctor's not behind you, after a while, your family's like, what's up? You know, um, maybe you should just go back on steroids again. So that causes true isolation. And along with this uncertainty, it's just a heavy, heavy load. Parents can face threats of child protective services. And um, to try to address this, ITSAN has been working on getting TSW awareness resolutions passed in states just to give um, parents a leg to stand on. Um, and these resolutions are around the fact that TSW is a real condition and that um, it's a call for more research. Um, so this is a way that if, if you do have interest in there and if you are dealing with some of these things, please reach out. Um, then there's also broken trust. And when a trusted doctor or treatment fails you, it's really easy to lose faith in the system. Anger is totally natural, right? Blame is just human nature. Fear is completely understandable. So many come out from medical oversight amidst this condition um, just because they don't know who they can trust. They don't know where to turn. And they try to do this on their own, which really is not a good idea because it's extremely severe. It's very debilitating. So, you know, who and what do you believe? That's a hard place to be. And then hypervigilance. Um, because our bodies are so hyper reactive during this time, it can lead to just this paranoia around, oh my gosh, I can't touch this. I can't eat this. I can't be exposed to this. It's just going to make it worse. So you're constantly in this fight or flight type of attitude, um, you know, which just adds to the stress of the whole experience. So needless to say, the mental and the emotional burden of TSW is very, very real, especially when it continues to go on. Um, and I liken it in my book as, as to wearing a, a heavy backpack. When you start on the trail, you're kind of excited, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to get through this. Yes, I'm strong. And hopefully at the end of it, you know, I'll, uh, maybe my eczema will even be like reduced or gone. <laughs> and so you've got some energy, but as time goes on and the flares continue or you get better and then you get worse, TSW is very much like a roller coaster. Every disappointment that comes your way can feel heavier and heavier, just like that backpack on that trail. After you're wearing that for like six hours, eight hours, 10 hours, now instead of feeling like 50 pounds, it feels like about 500. So the mental emotional burden cannot be understated. And then um, these, these people really need community. And I'm happy to say with ITSAN, um, we, we do have a Facebook group um, that's private that people can come in and ask questions and just get support about this. But that is super important. Seek support and seek community. So what else can you do if you're dealing with um, TSW? Know your worth. Take the time and the effort needed to take care of yourself and get healthy because you are worth it. And it can take a lot of effort, um, but just know um, it's worth getting to the other side. I will testify to that. <laughs> I'm so glad um, that that I continued and, and stayed strong. And really, that was due to my family and the community that, that was around me. So also get informed. It stands a great source of evidence-based literature and resources for people who are concerned about TSW. You can, on their website, they've got a whole host of all the literature that's around this um, that you can read up on and learn about. Get empowered, know your rights as a patient and download resources to back you up. Find strength and encouragement by connecting with the global TSW online community, like I just mentioned. Um, find a healthcare provider that you trust. If your doctor's not supportive, get a new one. Um, a lot of people don't realize that that's, that's actually um, something that you can go ahead and do. Uh, many doctors, even those who are unfamiliar with TSW, will be supportive and work with you to regain your health. You just need to find that right person, so don't give up. And then participate in research. Um, interest in TSW research is growing, I'm so happy to say, and there are going to be numerous opportunities to get involved to find answers and change medical history. So if you're going through TSW, we just ask you to, you know, participate in these opportunities when they come your way, because you can be part of that change. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Leo. Please reach out if you have any questions with me. Um, I have my email here, but uh, thank you so much again for the opportunity, Nia, and thank you all for coming here today. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of it from the kind of clinic, clinician's perspective, from a clinical perspective, because it really is complex. And I was looking through the Q&A. There are some great questions. And the truth is, 
we have a lot of questions ourselves. There are so many questions that are unanswered. These are my disclosures, but we're not really going to talk too many, too much about medications. Although I do work with a lot of the new companies on upcoming things because I'm so interested in, in getting out of this vicious cycle of steroids. So, you know, when we're treating any chronic condition, but particularly atopic dermatitis, we really have three big hurdles we have to get over. We have to first get the skin cleared up, but then we have to keep it clear safely. And then the patient and the family has to be able to keep it up. And this is actually easier said than done. These are really hard because maybe you have something that is pretty safe, like for example, phototherapy, which I love, but a lot of people can't keep it up. It's just too much work, too much time to come to an office and get light therapy. Uh, and so sometimes we end up doing things that are tricky and maybe not ideal for the long term. We know that there are some really good guidelines for managing this condition, and they keep getting better and better every year. We get more and more knowledge, what I call the virtuous cycle of drug development. We're getting new treatments that are helping us better understand atopic dermatitis, which then helps us treat it better. But you can see the base therapy on the bottom is good education, avoiding things that we know will irritate the skin, good moisturization, things like that. But then that first level up really still is topical steroids. And so for a long time, really since the 1950s, all we've had is topical steroids. And then in the early, really 2000 and 2001, we got our first kind of non-steroidal agents. And that was tacrolimus and pimacrolimus, the topical agents. And then it wasn't all the way until 2016 that we had the next non-steroidal, which was chrysoboral or eucrisa. So it's been a long time coming. And finally, we're in a bonanza. We're finally in this great period after all of these years. And for my own practice, really more than a solid decade of practicing with almost no non-steroidal options, really, really stressful. As we see at the top, we can do some intense things like hospitalization or the systemic immunosuppressants like cyclosporin or methotrexate. But we really try to avoid those things. Those have their own whole set of problems. So we've, we're have we really in this kind of a golden age of eczema finally. And, and I think that's part of why we have some ideas now for what to do with TSW, or at least how to avoid it sometimes. So the two, two key patterns that I see in my practice, there are many patterns of, of the, the disease. It can flare up and get better and flare up and get better for some, like on the upper left. But the two that I'm most interested in is, first of all, the, the key one that I want is in the top row middle. This is the one that we want everyone to be. This is what I call the damping pattern. They're getting better and better and better over time. So an ideal situation is when somebody says, doc, I use the medicines, you know, be it the creams or whatever it was, a little bit here and there, but I'm feeling better and better. I'm using it less and less and the flare-ups are not as intense. That's what we want for everybody. But what sometimes happens and what I'll get referrals is the one on the upper right-hand corner, what I call escalating pattern. They're getting worse and worse. So, you know, I use, maybe they use hydrocortisone 2.5% cream. It was helping at first, but now the next flare is even worse. So they say, oh, here's some triamcinolone. They use that one. Then they get something even stronger or they're using tons of it and they're using it all the time. So that's red alert danger zone. And I think that is really kind of a pattern of almost like an addiction to a topical corticosteroid. And we get really worried. Now, the question came up, what about oral steroids? So I think oral steroids are every bit as bad, you know, in terms of TSW, but then a hundred times worse because they really expose your entire body to steroids. So we're, there's a real push to not use oral steroids anymore for eczema. Now, are there situations where they might be necessary? Yes, there can be, it can be stuck in a bad position. But when I meet patients and I meet them every day who say they're using steroids by mouth or by ejection, you can get the, the muscle shot. And I say, we have to get you off of that at all costs because it's, it's very, very dangerous. Uh, and of course, not only for the TSW risk, but also just for all the other health risks. So this is the pattern that I'm most freaked out about when I see this escalating pattern, people needing more and more, their flare-ups are worse and worse. This to me is the sign where we have to do something different. If we keep feeding this steroids, I think that we are almost for sure going to be on the path to TSW and, and really, you know, of course, right before that, the addiction. So what do we know about this? We know frighteningly little about it. It is a relatively new entity. There were some older papers, but here's part of the confusion. Some of those older papers really seem to be talking more about just bad effects from topical steroids, like there's a rosacea that can happen on the face from steroids, which I've seen once in a while. And some of it almost just seemed like what I might call physiologic withdrawal. If you have a lot of inflammation in your body, use a strong topical steroid or take an oral steroid. If you stop too soon, then you flare up. Like with poison ivy, we see this. Sometimes people take just a few days of an oral steroid and then they stop and their poison ivy goes crazy. But 
then within a few weeks, they're fine. So this is very different than what we're talking about with TSW, which seems to go on for months and sometimes even years, right? It's not just this little thing that is what I would again say physiologic, sort of what we might expect. So we wrote this paper a few years ago trying to describe it. We don't have any really good diagnostic criteria. So that makes our life really tricky. We don't have any special test at this point. People are working on it. There's a whole bunch of people now studying it, but it is really strange. We understand that one of the, the things that we'll see is it tends to be very red, lots of confluent redness all over. It tends to be stinging and burning. It can be itchy as well, but those tend to be important. And we often do see that history where people have needed a lot of steroids or ramping up pattern. But again, even that's far from perfect. So that's what I'm often looking for in my patients. But we did an update of this just a couple of years ago, back in 2021. And again, we're, we're seeing more descriptions, but there's a lot of heterogeneity. People tell different stories. And so I'm always very careful. I don't want to say, well, you can only say it's TSW if you had X, Y, and Z, because then I meet patients who maybe didn't use too much. But we started thinking about some of the things that might go into diagnosis and have been working for a while on trying to create this. So we think, you know, itch can be important and sleep disturbance is really common. Burning pain we talked about as something really common. Many people report a mood disturbance. They feel really down, depressed, or anxious, or all of the above. Uh, we also see these specialized signs like elephant wrinkles and the red sleeve sign and the headlight sign where the nose is sort of light compared to the redness of the rest of the face and so on. The hardest part for us is that, again, a lot of these are seen in eczema. And so separating this from severe atopic dermatitis has been really challenging. Now, Belinda Sherry is a wonderful doctor, and she has written some, some great papers, including her sort of discussion of it. And some of the signs she pointed out as being really important, as we've discussed, the red skin, the red sleeves, where the whole arm looks kind of red down to, to usually right at the wrist. It kind of cuts off sort of abruptly. And these elephant wrinkles, which often are kind of like thickened skin that's sort of edematous, and, and it seems pretty pretty unique. Now, this is somebody with the red sleeve pattern. You can see it ending abruptly at the wrist. And this is a sense of sort of the elephant wrinkles where that skin gets that kind of wrinkly look. Uh, we've done some biopsies to try to learn more. And under the microscope, I'm, I'm happy to say it's nothing dangerous that it looks like a cancer or anything like that, which is what's always in the back of my mind. But I'm unhappy to say that it ends up not being that helpful. It ends up kind of just looking like eczema. So again, part of the paper we're working on now is, is collecting a whole bunch. I have like seven or eight good skin biopsies from different patients so we can really look into this. But really, this is the pattern of eczema. We're seeing some swelling in the upper part of the skin, and we're seeing lots of inflammatory cells around the blood vessels that we see in eczema. And zooming you in even more. So we call this a, a lymphohistiocytic perivascular infiltrate. So what's going on? We don't even understand why it's caused. And I think Kelly put it beautifully. This does not happen to everybody, thankfully, but it's really unfortunate for the people that it does happen to. One thought is that it may have to do with the blood vessels in the skin. We know that topical steroids, they can decrease the production of nitric oxide. So that can have this effect on the vessels so that when you stop it, they get really vasodilated. The vessels open up and bring lots of blood flow, which can help explain the redness. It can also help explain the, the temperature regulation problems. People feel freezing cold because they have so much blood rushing to their skin. So what can we do to help? Well, the things we know, I think that are not controversial is we want to stop steroids. I think that's the key thing. And even if a patient is worried about it, I say, listen, I think we should try then to avoid steroid use. And this includes steroids in all their forms, topicals, orals, injectables, even like steroid eye drops, steroid nasal sprays. There are a lot of steroids out there. So we have to be careful. Um, I've had patients who didn't even realize that their nasal spray or their asthma treatment, you know, every, every way you can imagine there's steroids out there. And we can try lots of different things. So different types of antibiotics have been reported, antihistamines, calcineurin inhibitors, that would be like tacrolimus, um, you know, Protopic is the brand name of that one, uh, or Elidil is pimicrolimus, and then uh, cyclosporin pill, um, ultraviolet therapy. And sometimes you'll see in the literature, people have said, maybe we should try oral steroids. I don't, I don't like to do that. I think that's dangerous. Uh, and dupilumab, I wrote a paper about dupilumab. The key thing for me would be prevention is better than cure. So my goal is to prevent it. And to do that, I really think that if we can ingrain in everybody that we really want to try not to overuse our steroids. So this is an example. This is just an example plan of how I might give it to my patients where I'd say, you know, for a new patient, 
And I'd say, listen, maybe you can use your steroid. In this case, I put mometazone when you're flaring up, but I put on the bottom, do this for several days up to one week until they're better. And then they need to take a break. So we really think that if people take a break from their steroid, and then in this case, they're using the tacrolimus, then they can then use that steroid again on and off. And we think that if you're on and off, the vast majority of people will be okay with that. The danger part is when they're using more and more and more and more. And then I'm following up with them in like a month and saying, okay, how much time have you used the steroid? And if they tell me I've used it three out of the four weeks, no way, that's way too much. If they tell me they can't even take a day off, way too much, then we have to stop. If they tell me, oh, I only needed it like three days the first week and one day last week, and I haven't used it you know, since, hey, pretty good, right? Unlikely to be getting into trouble. Is it perfectly safe? No, right? No medicine is perfectly safe. Can we still have problems? Absolutely, right? I mean, this is not a guarantee, but it's pretty darn good. So some of the papers that have been looked at in the last couple of years have tried different treatments. We've mentioned some of those, the tacrolimus, the pimicrolimus, oral doxycycline, which we use for rosacea a lot, and then dupilumab, that's my paper, where we really did show a big improvement in a lot of people, people, not all, not all patients responded to it, but this is that paper. And we really were able to show many patients had some benefit, which is really nice. So this tends to be my treatment of choice, the dupilumab. Uh, we were able to show many people got much, much better overall. And nobody actually, thank goodness, got worse when we did it uh, or even stayed the same. Even that patient number one, you can see they started out with their IgA score, which is it's five points. You're either clear, almost clear, mild, moderate, or severe. So they started out as a four, which is severe, zero is, is clear. So they were severe. And then after uh, about 13 weeks, so you know, a few months of treatment, they were down to moderate and their body surface area was much lower. The other patients actually had much bigger improvements. You could see one of them was, was uh, down from three to one, the other one, three to one and four to two. So it really can make a difference for some patients. Um, and I think, okay, there were a couple of extra things in there. And there are some really new, exciting treatments on, on the market now that also help us. We have some new injectable agents besides dupilumab. We have uh, the one called uh, trilokinumab. We have another one coming called lebrikizumab. We have the oral JAK inhibitors, upadacitinib and abracitinib. And we have the topical JAK inhibitor, ruxolitinib, with even more stuff coming. So this is exciting. The biggest issue with our JAK inhibitors is that they have a bunch of scary warnings on them. Uh, these black box warnings that talk about things like infection and skin cancer and other cancers and stuff. So we have to be a little bit careful with them and some patients don't want to use them, but for the right patient, I do think they can be helpful. I'm not sure if they're an ideal treatment for TSW, but certainly there are a non-steroidal treatment systemically that I think can be helpful. Some of the more integrative things that I'll use in my practice our topical vitamin B12 cream. So this has been studied in a couple of different studies for eczema. And of course, TSW is not eczema, but it's often seen connected to it. So I like to use it in this context and that can be helpful. And we mentioned that nitric oxide and actually it turns out that B12 has an effect on that pathway. So it may be kind of unique and this is what it looks like, it's pink. So we use this for kids and adults and we have it made for them uh, and that's pretty neat. The other thing that's come out in the last couple of years is this wonderful paper about using black tea, a little compress with black tea. So this is showing patients, again, this is more for dermatitis, but a lot of my TSW patients do like it as well. Rapid improvement, the, the middle picture is day three and the, the picture on the right is day six. So it really helps these patients with their facial eczema and help them in a number of different capacities. The, the, what it looked like clinically, it helped with their itch and, and burning sensations and other things too. So this is the recipe for it. And we can get this to anyone who wants it, but literally it's just taking some tea and brewing it. And you can drink that first cup or pitch it. It's the second steeping. So we want to use that same tea bag. It's a little more, a weaker tea. It's more dilute. And then you tell patients, put it in the refrigerator, make sure it's nice and cool before you use it on your skin. Then you take a soft cloth and you can put it to the areas. And I think it's really gentle and really nice. So in conclusion, this is a terrible condition. We have so much to learn about it, but things are moving. It's just, you realize how slow things move in medicine because it takes time to come to consensus. It takes time to rule out other things. Uh, but the biggest thing I can say is that not all patients improve just with time. And so I, at least in my experience, so I worry about patients and families who say, well, we're just going to wait because I've had people with um, TSW for five years, seven years, nine years. And I feel like to wait nine years for something to change is, is really asking too much. So I think it's really important to at least talk about some of the options. Of course, we want to avoid all steroids, 
but we could use things like the dupilumab. We can talk about light therapy. We can even do some of the soothing treatments, at least trying them. And, you know, I think the hardest part is that it is a, it's a real difficult journey. I make no promises. You know, we go into it together, trying to find uh, better, better approaches and, and we're all still learning on it. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, everybody, you can continue to add your questions in the uh, Q&A chat box, the Q&A box, not the chat box. Um, so we do have a lot of questions and we don't have a ton of time. So let's get started. Um, first question is, uh, is it normal for skin to respond really well to steroids and then flare up within a few days of stopping it after tapering down? How long can I continue restarting the steroid cycle before worrying about it turning into steroid dependence resulting in TSW? Yes. So I'd, I'd say, you know, it's, it's normal. I mean, it's abnormal. It's a disease state, right? So I wish, I wish that nobody had to deal with that, but yes, within eczema, it's true. Like if you have bad eczema and you put some steroid on for a few days and you stop, yes, it's going to come back for almost everybody. The question is, you know, for, so here's the piece for the mildest patients, for the mildest patients, which none of you, none of those people are here tonight, you guys, just so you know, right. But that's part of the problem is on the internet. When you're reading people say, oh, all I did was cut out gluten or dairy or strawberries. That includes people that are pretty mild. So there's this conflation of eczema. It's, it can be really serious, but for the mildest condition, there's no doubt they people, there are people out there who put a little bit of steroid on for two days and are better, and then they don't need it again, or they need it again in a year. So yes, that's great. Those, but I don't, we don't, no, none of us know those patients. You know, I mean, I sometimes I'll see them. It's a patient I'm checking for a skin cancer, and they tell me they have a tiny bit of eczema. But for more severe eczema, right? If you just put a steroid on for a couple of days and you stop, it tends to flare up. So I almost always am going to have a non-steroidal plan. So like you saw that thing, we're going to use your steroid for a few days, and then maybe we're going to use a non-steroid for a couple of days longer to sort of maintain that. And then maybe if things are clear after that you might be able to come off everything, which is great. Eventually you will, but even in the short term, you might go on and off. There's no great answer to how much you can do it I mean, probably if you did, you know, a couple of days of steroids on and then at least a few days off, you know, equal time in a month, you probably could do that indefinitely. If you told me you use steroids for, you know, in the aggregate of a whole month, less than 14 days, you probably could do it for the rest of your life and not have trouble. Many people could. I still think that's probably too much because I think it's hard to keep it up. If you're needing to put this much steroid on your body all the time, most patients I think are going to burn out. So that to me is sort of one level. That's one threshold, about half the time in a month needing steroid anywhere on your body. The other piece though, is that is the ability to keep it up. So for any of those situations, if it seems like you're not going the right direction in that, that damping pattern that we want, uh, then I would talk about other options. Kelly, do you have anything to add to that one too? Uh, no, but I will say it is, it's really hard for patients when we have these really vague um, guidelines on the steroid creams themselves, right? And, and I remember thinking that too, and asking my pharmacist, asking my doctor, well, what does this mean? How long should a break be? How many breaks should I have? Because it says don't use for more than two weeks. And in my case, I wasn't using in the same spot for more than two weeks, because that's how high I interpreted it, because I just thought, well, I'll thin my skin if I keep using it on the same spot. But the problem was I was chasing that rash all over my body. So I was using it really consistently and I wasn't paying attention because I didn't think that I needed to. So it's a slippery slope. And like Dr. Leo said, if you see this pattern um, where you continue to get worse flares and they're shorter and shorter, that's when you need to start considering a new therapy in my estimation. <laughs> 100% agreed. Thank you. Okay, another question. Um, is it possible for people with eczema to moderate to severe eczema to avoid ster steroids altogether? If so, what might that look like both in terms of treatment and appearance of symptoms? Yes, and increasingly, you know, I try to, um, especially pretty much every patient that I get now, I mean, I only take referrals and I see a lot of severe patients basically we're not using money steroids anymore for the most part. So I, I try to go non-steroidal as much as I can. Now, sometimes I'll have them built in as a rescue because, you know, if somebody's really miserable and I'm talking topical, I don't use oral steroids unless I'm in serious trouble. Uh, in the last year, you know, and my whole practice is almost exclusively eczema. I've probably written two prescriptions for oral steroids and they're all no refills. You know, it's like, I'm going to use this as a bridge or you're miserable and stuck. We're going to do it. So I really try not to, but, um, but for topicals, I still do use them occasionally, but I I build them in as a rescue plan. So what would it look like? It would look like things like phototherapy or dupilumab or 
some of the non-steroidal things like the, the opsilura, the ruxolitinib cream, or the uh, the calcineurin inhibitors, so protopic and elidil, tacrolimus and pimacrolimus. So using all of those things, sometimes it also might mean doing lifestyle changes. You know, I've referred people to... Uh, well, we've, there's a couple of companies in France that actually have spa therapy. And I've had a few of my families go over to France, um, actually, and they've paid for it, which is really cool. I can't always get it for free for them, but a few times I've been able to, and they can actually do balneotherapy, spa therapy. So there are other approaches to this condition outside of just steroids. In fact, that's the paper we're working on right now. <laughs> Very cool. Great. Um, okay. Speaking of treatments, um, do you think that other treatments that people with eczema might, might be taking, calcineurin, calcineurin inhibitors, steroidal asthma inhalers, systemic immunosuppressants, might make it more likely for them to develop TSW? I'd, I'd say I don't know. It's definitely, it's an area where we don't know. My guess is probably not. And if anything, my hope is that they would help minimize it because anything non-steroidal should hopefully give you a break from it. Um, but we don't know. I will say that this entity has been described before the year 2000. That's when the calcineurin inhibitors came out. So I, I don't think they necessarily... Um, I don't think you require those things to, to have this, but but right, I don't know. My sense is that some of my patients with TSW really do not like tacrolimus or pimacrolimus, that they feel like those can contribute, but not, not most of them. Most of the TSW patients I see can use those safely, but not all. And then the JAK inhibitors are so new, I think we're still trying to figure out where they fit in. Great, thank you. Um, uh, let's see, how about, uh, does TSW occur often in people who don't have eczema. What about people who have long-term use of steroids for other purposes? Do we see it in those populations? Kelly, what's your experience been with this? Yeah. We're seeing it more um, happening with other conditions. Um, one of the women I met recently actually was on a course of antibiotics and had a really bad rash in response to that medication and started using topical steroids and then became dependent on them from, from an antibiotic um, response. So uh, we've also heard from rosacea patients and some others, some people who have used orals. It's not as typical. Um, more people come into our community who have used the topicals for eczema. That is the most, probably, I would say probably 85 to 90% of the people who come in. And does that make you think there's anything special or unusual about people with eczema and their, their <laughs> likelihood of getting TSW developed? It seems that way, but there's really no way to know because it could be that our community is just talking a lot more about it or it's it's chronic. And so we use more of these drugs. We know that a lot of different skin conditions, I've been surprised with my work with a coalition, how many of these different conditions from psoriasis, vitiligo, alopecia, so many of them are using topical steroids to treat and manage. Um, but it's in the atopic dermatitis group that we're seeing the most people come, come out. So, you know, hopefully we will find that information once um, more research is done to try to figure out what's happening. Right. Um, okay, I've got kind of a combination of questions about TSW and Dupixent, so I'll start firing away. Can you please address any research or advice on using Dupixent while experiencing TSW? Can it help decrease the time and severity of TSW? Yeah, I mean, so again, we don't really know, but I wrote up that series. So my experience, my own personal experience, it has helped a lot of my patients, not all of them, but most of the patients I've given it to really do seem to improve. And it tends to be my first option for my TSW patients is either dupixent, the dupilumab or light therapy. And I think that's a really good option to try. And, and it is a pretty safe medication. It's now been out for a number of years. It actually came out in March of 2017. So we actually have a fair amount of experience. The thing I like best about it is that it has the potential for, and this is talking about for eczema right now, it has the potential to put people in remission, which I love, meaning I have a number of patients and I wrote a paper about this where we did it for a while, like six months or a year, then we stopped because they were doing so well and they actually have not had eczema again. Like it's not, I don't want to call it a cure, but they've not needed to go back on, which to me is the best thing in the world. Like they're basically medicine free or using just topicals. Again, they haven't needed to use any systemic medicines, which is kind of a big deal. Um, so along those lines, do you have any recommendations or thoughts on when to come off Dupixent when using it for TSW? Does the skin need to be completely clear? 
Yeah. So in general, my advice would be you want to do it for a long enough time that your skin is really clear and not like bubbling up still. You know, sometimes people say just before I get my shot, I have a flare up. I feel a little irritated. I'd say, oh, you're probably not ready to come off yet. Um, I mean, you can always try. That's the cool thing. It's very forgiving. You could stop, but I just hate to have people feel miserable. The other cool thing is because dupilumab, the way it works and it's, it has such a long half-life, it's not fully out of your system for about eight to 10 weeks. So even if you skipped a dose, you could, you could wait a little and see how you're doing a few weeks into it. And you can always jump back on, you know, it's not recommended to play with it too much because you can actually induce your body to make an, an antibody against it, which would be bad. But if you wanted to intermittently space out or miss a dose, you could try it. And I do that with my patients, especially if they're doing well, but yeah, if you're not doing really great, I really want you clear or just about clear all the time for at least a few months. You know, I want to make sure you've had stability for three months. Then I think there's a pretty good chance that you can come off of it, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. Somebody mentioned a concern about um, dupixent delaying healing process. I'm assuming in TSW. Do you, do you have any concerns with that? Yeah, I mean, again, I don't know. You know, I think we're still learning. I, my sense is that once I've met patients who were five, six, seven, nine years, I'm, you know, I kind of, I don't like the narrative that you just have to wait. I think that is a bit of a toxic narrative. Um, and I see this in another totally, well, related, but different environment. So I'm, you know, I'm integrative. I do acupuncture and I work with a lot of naturopaths and holistic docs. And one thing that I find that I think can be kind of toxic and actually kind of patient I think it's kind of patient hostile. I don't think they mean it in a bad way, but they'll have a patient do, let's say a dietary change or a supplement, maybe an expensive supplement, you know, and the patient's like, gosh, this supplement they want me to buy. It's like, you know, hundred dollars a month or whatever, these herbs. And I've been doing it for six months and I don't think it's helping. I think I'm actually getting worse. And Dr. Leo, they said, just don't be a baby, like stay in it longer. It's just going to take time Just stay longer. Or if they're on a diet, they'll say, did you even make one mistake on the diet? Well, then you're, you hit the reset button. You need to keep doing it. And I'm like, I think that we can drive ourselves crazy with this. You know, after a certain point, we need to just say, okay, well, you know, years of suffering is worth treating. So, so the, again, but the truth is I don't know, but, but I do know that some people don't seem to get better no matter what they do. And so I'm, I think it's worth it for most people to have some relief, especially for, again, the level of patients I'm seeing. Some people can't get out of bed. They can't go to work. They're not even living life. So it's like, maybe, maybe if they waited long enough, uh, you know, they would eventually get better, but I don't know. And, and, and the damage being done from being in this state for this time, it's real. Like, right. We can't just write this off and say, Oh, it was just healing time. I mean, this is just, just, you're losing your, your childhood. You're losing your adulthood. You're losing everything. So we need to, we need to do something. I think, you know, again, I offer it to the patient. I don't put, I don't advertise. I don't push it on anybody, but if a patient wants to my opinion, that's my opinion. We should try something. Thank you. Um, Kelly, you mentioned a long list of symptoms um, and, and also that there's no official diagnostic criteria, but for most people with TSW, will all of the symptoms typically occur? And is it still TSW if only some of the symptoms occur? We don't see everyone have the same symptoms and that's part of the mystery that we're trying to figure out. And we are all different physiologically, right? We all have different histories. Um, so some people will just have their upper body affected. Some people like me, I was full body, red, burning, oozing skin. Some people don't have as much oozing. Um, some have a ton of it. So there's typically two different types. It seems like of, of TSW where it's, um, the redness. So their erythema or there's pustules. That's another form that a lot of that's in the literature that a lot of people experience. Um, so no, you don't have to experience all of the symptoms. I had hair loss. I actually got a cataract. I had so many different things happen to me. The nerve pain was huge, but not everybody has, has these. So yeah, it's, it's a tricky little bugger and hopefully we will get that diagnostic criteria soon. I know Dr. Leo is working on that, which is amazing because that's going to be a huge helpful tool for doctors. Um, but the typical ones, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Leo, um, but the typical symptoms that, that we see in TSW are the burning. Um, that's different from the eczema. It's those red sleeves. It's the elephant skin and the nerve involvement. I think those are the top symptoms that we see with TSW. And would you say anything in addition to that, Dr. Leo? No, 100% agreed. And I think the hardest part for us is that my, you know, so I'm convinced, like I've, you know, I treat it all the time and I think it's real, but um, I still meet colleagues still who are like, I don't know if it's real. I'm not sure it's a real thing. And it's so difficult to push back because I'll, I'll mention these things. I'll say, well, it could just be contact dermatitis. Well, it could be eczema. And it's just so difficult differentiating it right now. Yeah. Yeah. Kathy mentioned in the um, chat 
profuse shedding of skin is another one. And that is true. In my pictures, you didn't see it because I was taking a bath every couple of hours. And so that skin was coming off, but I, I could not believe how much skin my body was making every day. It was crazy. Sounds exhausting to make that much skin. It was. Yeah. yeah. Kelly, somebody asked um, how long your TSW lasted. So in the very beginning, I think a lot of people feel this and that's why they just keep prolonging things. Um, I thought three months, I'm going to be in it through it. You know, I'm, I'm healthy. I exercise, I juice fast. I do all the things, <laughs> but three months, I wasn't even peaked at that point. I mean, three months, it was, it was probably the next month or two, I became bedridden and it was a year and a half of really, really bad. And then it was three years. Um, that was, I would say pretty significant. And after that, um, Actually, when I started into 2012, we didn't have Dupixent. We didn't really have any options except for chemo drugs. I mean, that's that's kind of what it, where it was. And I know this is this is a debatable thing, and it's it's really really hard. Um, like Dr. Leo was saying, it can be toxic to just tell people to wait and wait and wait and wait and don't try anything, and then you're dealing with these fears that people have of the system and taking another drug because if this is what happened with topical steroids, what's going to happen if I take a different drug? There's a lot of things that you're dealing with. Um, I ended up getting on um, traditional Chinese medicine because I figured that's probably a little bit easier for my body to handle. And it helped me tremendously. It doesn't help everybody. I was about eight months in that protocol and it took away all the redness, like the existing redness that was still in my body. But um, afterwards, I still had residual stuff but I felt like I could handle it. So, you know, I'm, I was sensitive if I'd eat certain things or if I stayed up way too late, you know, my skin was sensitive, like I had eczema. So it, it was years for me. Um, would I do it different? I'm not sure, you know, with all the options that we have at this time, because it was such a stress on my family. Um, and the mental load is really, really hard. And when you're in isolation, I've talked to people who have had a lot of fear. Like I'm so scared to try another drug. And I'm like, listen, you're contemplating if you want to live another day. I think you should try that. <laughs> I think you just need to get yourself to a space where you can handle life again. Cause it's, it's not okay to give up. Um, and, and who knows, maybe you, you do this for six months, a year, like Dr. Leo said, you may just need a break and then you can get off of that again, but why not try Right. Beautifully well, put. Oops, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. No, I was just going to say that's beautifully put. I mean, life is a risk. And I, there's a question that I see in the chat about, you know, what about the new therapies? Aren't they potentially dangerous? And couldn't we be in the same situation? The answer is yes, you know, and there certainly are. Any medicine, if it does something, then there's a side effect for sure. Like you can't, you literally cannot. If anybody tells you there's medicine with no side effect, you got to walk out because because anything that's going to do something, I mean, even water, if you drink too much water, you get potomania, you can die. Like, right, you know, or you could drown in water and there's nothing that's perfectly safe. So anything that does anything is going to have it, but, but right at the same time, life is terminal. We've got one life the time, the timer starts moving the moment you're born. And so if we worry about everything and don't, I mean, is it possible cell phones are giving us brain cancer? It sure is. <laughs> it really is. 5g just kicked in. I don't know. Right. Who knows? I mean, I mean, but I still, you know, I still carry my phone next to my body, right. We could find this out, you know, is driving to go to your Pilates class. You potentially get in a train wreck and, you know, hit, get hit by somebody. Yeah. I mean, it's all, so there's all risks and ba benefits and constantly in the balance. I think that's what's so stressful too, because we're trying to find a way to, to maximize and do so safely. Well, we're coming up on time. I have two more that I hope we can address quickly. Um, one is how can people with eczema, especially something like chronic, like atopic dermatitis, whose primary eczema care providers aren't aware of TSW, um, how can they advocate themselves in their eczema care to prevent TSW during their course of treatment? Kelly, all you. Oh man, I was gonna, I was gonna have you <laughs> speak to that as a doctor because I know sometimes patients can come in with their their big huge folder of all their Google Docs that they <laughs> they they downloaded and they're educating their doctor. That can be um, adversarial. It can feel threatening. It can feel you know to doctors who don't have a lot of time to begin with, um, frustrating. So I would say you know, if there's a way to communicate before your appointment and just let them know, hey, this is what I'm thinking about. Do you know anything about this? Um, how would you suggest that we move forward together? Also, it's really helpful for patients to have some talking points written down before you go in so you don't get side 
sideline talking about, you know, dogs and pets and things like that. And you completely miss all of the things that are re you're really concerned about. Try to maximize the time that you have with your doctor. Be respectful, um, be open. It's so much about that relationship and that trust. And so they need to hear from you. Yes, if you have concerns, but also be open to have that conversation. I don't know if you would add to that, Dr. Leo. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think if they, if they say, I don't believe in it, which I've had patients tell me that they're still hearing, then maybe a good response would be, okay, no problem. But could you humor me? Can we then treat what you call it my eczema? That's fine. But can we treat it then without steroids? And if they say no, then I think you need to find a different clinician because it's just, there's like I say, we're so lucky we have other things. And again, would I vouch that they're all perfectly safe? No, but I think they're probably all as a general group safer than abusive steroids, right? I think, and that's the purpose of all these things to try to find non-steroidal options because honestly, up until a few years ago, most people would just say, well, why would I, why would you use anything else? Steroids work great. They're super cheap, right? They cost almost nothing. You can get them. So why do you guys, why are you guys fighting for these other things? Well, now, now we really have some reasons why we can say, because it can really devastate people. Yeah. Thank you. So that explains what people should do before in order to avoid um, TSW. What if somebody thinks they do have, they suspect they might have TSW, what are their next steps? Yeah, I think, again, because we don't really know, um, I think the best we can say is trying to treat it similarly to eczema without steroids, you know, so thinking about the phototherapy, thinking about dupilumab, talking to your, you know, talking to your clinician about that, talk to your doctor about it and see what they think. Um, you know, I, 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 I saw a thing in the chat. I don't, I don't see out of state patients anymore. I did through the pandemic, but they've kind of closed that down. So I unfortunately don't, but if you can find someone locally that can help support you, that's really important too. And definitely join NEA. You're already here and it's Sam, right? Because those are groups of people that are, I think there to support and help with ideas. Well, I think that's all we have time for. We're finishing two minutes late. So I thank you for your extra time. And I thank everybody for joining us. Um, I want to remind you all that you are um, welcome to join us for an upcoming webinar. Um, you can go to nationaleczema.org backslash or front slash webinar dash Wednesdays. Um, we'll be sending out a, a copy of this webinar for you to watch. And um, we hope you come to nationaleczema.org for more resources to live well with eczema. Um, that's nationaleczema.org. And um, on behalf of National Eczema Association, I thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you all for coming tonight. Mm -hmm.